So let's talk about section 3.6, curve sketching. This is basically using intercepts, like x and y intercepts, uh, your relative max, relative min, which are your <coughs> relative extrema, and your concavity to sketch a curve, to graph it, to see a really good approximation of what it looks like without a graphic calculator. Now, yes, your graphic calculator will do it for you, but to understand why these graphs are shaped the way that, that they are, you need the calculus. You need to really understand why they are the way that they are. Should we do an example? Yeah. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you an example, and I'll give you the steps as we go through that. Would that help you? So here's your example. Here's your example. And I'll tell you how to do this problem verbatim, just exactly like you should, all right, with every single step. Step number one, when you're graphing any curve, is, well, you want to find out as many intercepts as you can, x-intercepts and y-intercepts. That's always a good thing to do, right? Because in most cases, that gives you at least an approximation of what you're talking about, where you're crossing the y-axis, where you're crossing the x-axis. So step number one, every time, You're going to find the intercepts. <coughs> By the way, how do you find x intercepts? How do you find x intercepts? Y Say it? Y equals zero. Y equals zero. So set the equation equal to zero, that's how you find x intercepts. You set equal to zero, you solve for x. That's going to give you any roots. That's what a root was, right? When you set the function equal to zero and you solve for x, you're finding out where it's crossing the x axis. That's a whole exact idea. Should make sense, right? Because if you set y equal to zero, that means you're going to find out everywhere you cross the x axis. Do you believe me? Now, the y intercept is quite a bit easier. By the way, <clears throat> you only do this step if it's easy. Easy, easy means it's quadratic or lower, or it's already factored for you. Okay, so cubics, don't spend your time factoring them. Um, if I give that to you on a test, I'll just give you the x-intercepts. I'll say, here are your three x-intercepts. You follow me on that? So if it's, if it's easy, do that. Easy means, so I know this is recorded so you don't cheat me, easy, me, easy means quadratic, linear, or if it's already factored for you, that's easy. Everything else, cubic or higher, is hard. Unless you can just see a root right off the bat, that would be considered easy. Believe me? With me? Okay. If it's easy. For y-intercepts, uh, how do you find y-intercept? Easy, really easy to do. X equal to zero. Set x, plug in zero. You plug in zero for x, and it'll give you a y-intercept. That's the easy one. That's nice. You, you all need to find that for every single one of these, if it exists. <coughs> Let's try it. Let's try it. So this will be step number one. I'll try to write out every step for you. Step number one. Solving for x-intercept. How do you solve for the x-intercept? Well, this is just basic algebra. You're going to take your function, you're going to set it equal to 0, and you're going to solve for x. So we will have x plus 2, x minus 1 squared equal to 0. Can you find your x-intercepts from right there? That's great. That's great. Because it's already factored for you. Can you tell me what's one of your x-intercepts? You'd have x plus 2 equals 0 x minus 1 equals 0 because of zero product property. So x equals negative 2, very good, and x equals 1. You have two x-intercepts. Richard, I feel okay with that. 
If this hadn't been factored for you, you just skip it. I'd give them to you, okay? Uh, part two of step number one is find your y-intercept. Y-intercept says you need to plug in zero for x and see what you have. So I'm going to take zero plus two times zero minus one squared. Don't forget <coughs> squared before you multiply. Uh, what is zero minus one? Mm. Negative one squared one. times two. is two. You get two. The y-intercept is two. Do you feel okay for for this so far? Yes. All right. Step number two. Step number two applies only to rational functions. It does not apply to polynomials because polynomials do not have this. I'm going to put step number two and a little asterisk. The asterisk means for rational functions only. For rational functions, a lot of times with rational functions, you're going to get some asymptotes, right? You're going to get some holes. So for rational, uh, polynomials don't have those. It's continuous everywhere. You don't have asymptotes, you don't have holes. So this is why it's only for rational functions. You're going to find all the asymptotes, vertical and horizontal, and any holes. Do you remember when vertical asymptotes exist? Denominator. Denominator equals what? Zero. And you can't... When do holes exist? Okay, so denominator equals zero gives you asymptotes or holes. If you can cross it out, it's a hole. If you can't cross it out, it's an asymptote. Vertical asymptote, denominator equals zero, not removable. Whole, denominator zero, equals zero, removable. How do you find horizontal asymptotes? Good thing we covered that stuff. Horizontal asymptotes occur. That's what we, the whole last section was about. It said, can you find the asymptotes as we go to the right, as we go to the left? That's what we were finding. We we're finding horizontal asymptotes at zeros or at ones. That's what that did. And so what we're going to do here for horizontal asymptotes, <coughs> you take the limit. Some more? You take the limit as we go x approaches infinity or x approaches negative infinity. You have to do both of them because you know the limit could change. Remember that one third, right? It could change. So you've got to be careful on that. Take the limit. So, do we need to do step number two for that problem? Is it rational? So if it doesn't have a denominator, we're not going to be able to do that. If it had a fraction, you had denominator with a variable down there, then of course we would be doing that. But right here we don't. So now we're going to go on to step number three. Step number three is you finally get to do some calculus. You're going to do the first derivative test. You remember the first derivative test? You had a whole homework section on that, right? First derivative test, you said equal to zero. It will give you two things, critical numbers and increase and decrease. And, and that's what you care about, right? You care about where are my maxes, my mins, how am I going up, how am I going down. And that's what you care about. First derivative test. Why? Because it's going to give you critical numbers and increase and decrease. Or areas where the graph will increase or decrease. Hey, let's try that now. We'll get, you know what, maybe I'll give you, give you all the steps and then we'll, we'll go through it. 
Step number four. Sorry, I'm kind of backwards. Uh, one, two, three, just pretend we're reading a book backwards or something. Step number four. After you do the first derivative test, what do you think you're going to do next? Second. Geniuses. The second derivative test. What does the second derivative test give you? Yep, the reason why you do it, just like Scott said, you're going to do for concavity and for inflection points. <clears throat> Step number five, remember the table I had you make that has the first derivative on the top? Second derivative on the bottom, it tells you increasing, decreasing, increasing, all that stuff, and tells you concavity. So basically, it gives you a picture of your graph right there. That's what you make. So make the table. <clears throat> you know, they're very long problems. Especially, oh my gosh, especially with rational, they take a long time. A very long time. Uh, they're not easy. Well, actually, they're not hard. They're, just, they're very time consuming. So they're going to take a long time. Not gonna lie. Number six. At this point, you're gonna have everything you need. All right. You're gonna have your intercepts. That's huge. You're gonna have any asymptotes. You put those on your graph. You're gonna have any holes. You put those on your graph. You'll have your critical numbers and your inflection points. What you won't have is the actual points. Right. You'll have critical numbers. Plug them in. Find all possible points. Relative <coughs> minus, relative minus, and inflection. Find your points from the original function. The last, if you get the points, you get all the areas of increase and decrease of concavity, grab it. Okay, we're going to get at least the first two tests done on this thing. We already have the, <clears throat> the intercepts. We've got x and y. We don't need to do step number two because we're not rational. We're going to do the first derivative test. Now, don't fool yourself here. Yes, that looks pretty nasty. That You say, oh my gosh, that's a product rule with a chain rule or a general power rule in it. That could get pretty hairy and then have to set equal to zero. Or maybe be a little bit smarter about that. Probably easier to distribute that, right? Maybe distribute some of those easier ones first. That way you don't have to do all those rules. Now, if it was to the sixth power or something, firstly, that'd be insane. But <laughs> secondly, um, you wouldn't want to do that. So just go ahead and, and maybe distribute that. So why don't you try that right now? Hopefully you got that. Did you get that? Okay, keep working. <laughs> Step number one, we got